السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. ألف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب المبين. إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحمل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أما بعد. So today we're getting started with a study of Surah Yusuf ayah by ayah. And I'm going to try to limit these lectures to between 30 and 45 minutes at the most. Uh, my intention today, inshallah, is to cover the first two ayat of Surah Yusuf. Uh, even though we had a five-part introduction and it was rather long, there are lots more things to say in the introduction, but I've decided to intersperse them through the course of the lecture itself instead of holding off on getting started with the surah uh, on its own. So let's begin, inshallah ta'ala. And I'll start by translating uh, the ayah number one for you and then discuss it a little bit. Alif Lam Ra Tilka Ayatul Kitab al Mubin. Alif Lam Ra, those are the miraculous or divine signs of the clear and clarifying book. That would be a simple translation of the first ayah. Those are the miraculous signs or the divine signs of the clear and clarifying book. Uh, the first thing to note is the opening letters of the surah, Alif Lam Ra. Um, if you're a regular reader of the Quran or student of Quran studies, you know that a lot of surahs in the Quran are in groups. They're bunched together, right? And if you don't know that, well, now you're going to learn something about that. Um, so there are a number of surahs that have a similar style, and you can tell that they are related to each other, or Allah wants us to consider them connected to each other more deeply. Uh, by the way, Allah opens those surahs. And the surahs that open with alif, lam, ra uh, are like that. So you have, this is surah number 12. I'll take you back to surah number 10, which is Yunus. Um, and... It's important to know surah number 10, Yunus, is a Makki surah. And all the way from there to surah number 23 are going to be Makki surahs. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way to 23 are surahs that were given to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. Right before that, surahs number 8 and 9 are Madani surahs. So this is, a, this is part of a larger group of surahs that are, that are Makki. Within them also, uh, you know, this first part are a bunch of surahs, actually five of them, that begin with alif, lam, and ra. So you find in the beginning of Surah Yunus, alif, lam, ra, tilka ayatul kitab al hakim Those are the miraculous signs of the wise book. So here we saw the clear and clarifying book in the 10th surah in the beginning, the wise book. 11th surah, alif, lam, ra, again. Tilka kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu, summa fussilat, summa fussilat min ladun hakim al khabir. Uh, a book whose ayat, whose miraculous signs were stitched together and then they were opened up and explained on behalf or from, from, from the one that, that contains or possesses all wisdom and has all news. Then Surah Yusuf, the one we're looking at, Alif Lam Ra Tilka Ayatul Kitab al -Mubin. Then after that is the only one that doesn't have Alif Lam Ra. Surah Ra'ad, it has Alif Lam Mim Ra. So that's the only one that's got a little bit of an extra letter. Alif Lam Mim Ra Tilka Ayatul Kitab Waladi Unzila Ilayka Mir Rabbika Bil Haq. Surah number 14, Ibrahim, Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun, Anzalna, who Ilaykari, or Fijanas, Minapulumati, Ilanur, who Idi Rabbihim, Ilasirat, and Aziz, Aziz, and Hamid. Surah number 15, again, Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitabi, or Quran, and Mubin. So you've got each one of them opening with Alif Lam Ra and then saying something about the book itself, the revelation itself. It seems. Obviously, we don't know what uh, the letters mean. There's lots of theories about that, but clearly Allah knows best. And he did not, he chose not to tell us what alif lam ra or alif lam mim or kaf ha ya in sad, etc. mean. But the entire purpose of the book is for us to learn, right? And the question, the first question that arises is, how do you want me to learn something? I don't even know what it means. What am I supposed to learn from that, right? Because Allah says, Allah al Quran, he taught the Quran. Obviously, when you teach someone, you're helping them understand. And here you have a number of surahs, in our case right now, that are beginning with letters we don't understand. We don't know what the purpose of them is, right? Uh, there are a few things about that that are important to know. The most important of all of them is an orientation. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. It's as if, you know, if, if a teacher was going to teach you something, it's important for a teacher to also set limits and say, this is what I'm going to teach you, and this is beyond the scope of your knowledge at the moment. And Allah 
teaching us guidance, one of the first parts of his orientation to us over and over again in different surahs is, there are some things you are not meant to know. And I will be the one who knows and you don't. And this is an important orientation. Allah has all knowledge, including what Alif Lam Ra means, and you and I don't. We, we don't have that knowledge. And that reminder is necessary, especially in certain surahs. Now why is it, for example, in the story that we're studying right now in the surah, most of it's going to be Surah Yusuf, is going to be about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So why is that reminder important for us in studying Surah Yusuf? These three ayat that are coming in the beginning are going to be an introduction before we get into the story itself. Well, it's important because the story of Yusuf alayhi salam has a lot of details. There's a lot of people involved. He's got 11 brothers. There are parents, there's a lineage, there's a map involved, there's, the, there's Canaan, you know, and so there, there, um, there's the journey involved, there's the empire, the Egyptians, the minister, the minister's wife, it's called, he's called Potiphar in, in, you know, uh, in biblical literature. Uh, so there are lots of characters and individuals and names and places and information involved, but the Quran is skipping out on a lot of them. In fact, I told you that the father of Yusuf alayhi salam is Yaqub. The word Yaqub doesn't occur in this surah. The, Allah just says his father, his father, their father, their father. Doesn't mention him by name. Not here. Other places he mentions them, but not here. Right? So it's important for us to know that Allah is withholding information. Allah is withholding information. And the first thing he's withheld is what does Alif Lam Ra mean, right? That's the first thing he withheld. And that's Allah's way of saying there are some things that you need to know for the purpose of guidance. And there are other things that you become very curious about, but they won't serve the purpose of guidance. So I want your attention on what will serve the purpose of guidance. And I also want you to know that there are some things only meant to be known by Allah, no matter how curious you get. Now what happens in Surah Al-Imran, we learn that there are people that become obsessed with the things they're not meant to know. Like they're just obsessed with, I have a theory on Alif Lam Mim, I think I figured it out. Or I know what the seven skies mean, I got, I got it. Or there are, there are realities Allah describes that the, you know, the actual nature of them, there's no way for us to, to know or verify. But people become obsessed with those obscure parts. Like I met someone after khutbah one time, it was in California somewhere, and this gentleman sat me down and said, he found the cave where the people of the cave were sleeping. He found it. I was like, how'd you find it? Well, look, I looked at the words of the Quran, and then I looked at Google Earth, and then I, you know, and the, the sun position, and he, I mean, for an hour, I'm just trying to eat my chicken shawarma, and it went stale, because the guy was just pinpointing the exact location. I think it was in New Jersey somewhere. I'm kidding. But um, the point is, you're obsessed with something that, if Allah wanted you to know the geographical location of the cave, he'd tell you, right? So we become obsessed with other information. It's actually similar in this story. People a lot of times ask, so what happened to the minister's wife? Did she like get married to him later? Or what was her name? What, what was her name? And how old was he when this happened? And why are you obsessed with all these questions that Allah didn't teach you about? So he's withholding from the beginning to orient you. And then he's also saying, Tilka ayatul kitabin mubin. Those are miraculous revelations, signs of the clear and clarifying book. In other words, the book is clear in and of itself, and somebody comes along and says, but wait, I'm not clear on some of the historical details. I'm not clear on some of the names. I'm not clear on some of this other information. And Allah is pretty much teaching us that what needs to be clear has been made clear. And what He did not make clear was for your own benefit. He's to teach you that's not everything that you are curious about needs to be made clear. The, 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 the mandate of guidance comes from Allah, not from us. So that's a remarkable orientation and one of the benefits of the beginning. The other thing I feel, there's a question about tilka, which I'm translating as those are the divine signs, the ayat of the clear and clarifying book, right? So the word those sounds like it's far away. And it's remarkable that that's being used because the word book uh, is referring to perhaps to the actual written word of Allah, which was not given to the Prophet wasallam. The actual writ written word of Allah is fi kitabim maknun la yamastuhu illa mutahharun. It's in a hidden book with Allah's possession that only the closest angels can access. And from it, what is learned by Jibreel alayhi salam is delivered to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the original copy is with who? 
Allah, and that's far away. And when you point at something far in Arabic, you use dhalika or tilka or udaika, you use far away. So those are the miraculous signs. Those are the divine signs of the clear and clarifying book. Now the word book becomes understandable because the word book obviously refers to something written in your hand, a writ, something, a document. But the Prophet ﷺ, we know, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ You weren't reading any book before this, and you didn't write it with your own hands. So the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have access to books, per se. He doesn't even have access to books. So why is the Qur'an calling itself a book, especially in Makkan Qur'an, early Qur'an? You know, the, the migration hasn't even happened yet. We're not directly dealing with the Jews and Christians, even though there are some narrations that the Jews asked a question about the migration. But there's not much interaction with them. What Allah is telling us is two things by use of the word book. One thing He's telling us is, the, perhaps the origin of the Qur'an is it's part of a much larger book that contains all of the scriptures of Allah. So it contains what was given to, you know, Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. It, it contains the scriptures given to Abraham, the scripture given to, to Moses, the scriptures given thereafter, what was given to David, to Dawud alayhi salam, what was given to Jesus, all of it's contained in there. Every, every one of them is there, and the Qur'an is there too. And these are ayat of that original book. So that's one implication. The other is that yes, it's a book up in heaven, but even though it is just words that are being rehearsed and recited right now, the, this, these aren't just words, they are a book. In other words, what you are reciting without any paper in front of you is actually a book. And it will actually become a, a written book also, accessible in written form. Almost like the destiny of the Qur'an to come, like we have a copy of Qur'an now in front of us. People at the time when they were hearing the word book, they had no book in front of them, right? But Allah knew it was going to turn into one, accessible to humanity. So He already called out what's coming in the future by saying these are ayat of the clear and clarifying book as it is in the heavens and, and as it is here. The other important thing is some of us who don't believe that the word tilka, those, refers to alif, lam, ra. In other words, alif, lam, ra are the ayat, are those ayat of the book. Now, why is that important? Because that's as if Allah is saying, Alif Lam Ra is a group of teachings of the Qur'an. This Surah Yunus, Surah Hud, Yusuf, then Ibrahim, then Hijr. And by the way, the only one that doesn't have la Alif Lam Ra, has Alif Lam Mim Ra, is ar raad And its name is Alif Lam Ra, ar raad <laughs> Okay, it's pretty cool. But that's Sheikh Sahib pointed that out. I was like, whoa, that's peculiar, you know. But anyway, these surahs clearly are connected as if Allah is saying, this teaching belongs to this group. These are out of that part of the book. And that's why Imam Razi and others also said, when Allah calls the, the book here Kitab, Kitab can also refer not just to the entire Quran, not just to Loh al-Mahfuz, Kitab can actually refer to a, a surah by itself. A, su a single surah can also be called Kitab. And a single surah can also be called Quran. A single surah can also be called a Quran. Because the word Kitab means a writ. A, a, something written. Not the whole thing, but something written. And Quran actually means recital. And a single surah is a single recital. And another surah is another recital. And another surah is another recital. And in that sense, each surah is also a Quran. Okay? So, and he takes it in that meaning too, that perhaps Allah is talking about, and this is Alif Lam Ra, yet another portion of the book that begins with Alif Lam Ra belonging to that group. Okay. Now I come to the the fun, there's two important things, and I, I realize a lot of you are interested in this series because of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. But you know what's really important for all of us is we have to humble ourselves to the way Allah teaches, to the way Allah speaks. You might think there are some parts that are juicy, I can't wait to get to those. The Qur'an has, you know, a teacher who knows what he's doing and no one knows what he's doing better than Allah. A teacher knows where you need to begin and what you need to hear first before you get to the next lesson, the next lesson, and the next lesson. So the sequence of the ayat is a divine curriculum. What does he want your attention on first? He decided. So you'll notice that the first three ayat have nothing to do with the story of Yusuf. And he wants this first. He wants us to go through this first before we get into the, the surah. So there are some things in here that I think are worthy of attention, and I'm going to make sure I highlight those first before we get into the, the fourth ayat onward. So what are those things? In simple words, there's a big difference in when you speak and when you write. When you speak and when you write. If you're writing an essay, 
or you're writing an email, or you're writing your thoughts about something, or writing an article, or writing a post on social media or something like that, you can write a paragraph, then you can go back and edit some words, you can take some sentences out, or you misspelled something, or you wrote a word that wasn't meant to be there, or you repeated yourself and you cut some sentences out altogether, or this paragraph seems, un seems unnecessary. Now, you can go through a refinement process, and then you can give it to somebody else and say, hey, look at, uh, take a look at this. Does this read well? Can I post it? And then they read it and say, yeah, it looks good. I would change this or this or this, right? So, so what I call an editorial process. So in writing, there can be an editorial process. And because of that editorial process, writing sounds a lot more formal. It sounds a lot more regimented and structured and organized and serious. As opposed to that, when you're speaking, mostly when you and I are speaking, we're casual. And we mess up and we repeat ourselves and we have gaps in speech and we say the wrong word or we have grammatical you know mistakes even as i was just explaining this to you i said grammatical you know mistakes i threw in a you know in the middle i wouldn't do that if i was writing it would seem odd if i threw a you know in the middle but in speech it sounds fine right so we have conjunctions or words or expressions we throw into speech that don't make their way into writing Right? And so the Qur'an is being called a kitab, writing. Right? So that means that there are, there's no room for a uh-huh, right, you know, of course, kind of like small add-ons here and there that you can take out later on and edit them. The, if something is written, and back then there was no backspace button, there was no select and cut or delete, there was no undo. All it was, once it's written, and it wasn't even written on paper, it used to be carved. Once it's carved, that's the final version. There's no editing it. So the Quran is claiming that whatever is coming out of the Prophet's mouth, sallallahu is the final draft. It's the original, and there's no edit possible. There's no edits that are going to happen. This, this is it. So that's another implication of kitab versus Quran. Quran means recital. The Quran is what is heard. Kitab is what is seen and read. Right? So Allah merges the two by describing the, the, our book as kitab, which refers to the written origin, and then he describes it as Qur'an, which is the Arabic that is recited. So both of those are unified. The oral tradition and the written tradition are connected together. That's, that's a unique feature of the Qur'an. Now, so tilka ayatul kitab al mubin the, the uh, I'll get to mubin, which is an important word, but one more thing about kitab. The story of Joseph is known to the, the Jews and the Christians for you know, thousands of years. They've known this story for a very long time. It predates Moses, right? So it's a, it's a very old story. And it's one of the most fundamental stories in biblical tradition for both the Jewish and the Christian people. It is in their book, it's at the end of the book of Genesis. And we believe that as the story was told in the Bible, it was actually revealed originally by Allah Azza wa himself. Right, so it's, a, it's originally revelation. Whatever version of it there is now, we believe the original was actually revelation, right? And the author of that revelation is Allah. And the origin of that revelation is the ultimate book that contains all revelations. So the story that occurs in the Bible originally was in this book. And Allah sent it down to them. But He didn't send them down this, this uh, revelation in Arabic. He sent it to them in Hebrew, didn't He? Because they're, the people were Hebrew. And so He took the knowledge that was in that book and he transformed it into Hebrew and delivered it to the Israelite people, right? Now, he's the same author, same story, but he's going to now retell the story, not repeat the story, this is important. When you repeat something, you're saying the same thing again. He's not repeating the story, he's going to retell the story. Retell the story means he'll say, he'll talk about the same events, but he'll talk about them in a new way altogether. He's going to highlight things that were not highlighted in the previous scripture. He's going to make you think about things that you didn't think about in the previous scripture if you read that book or if you read that story. And so he is going to, it's coming from the same author, so it's the same story, but now it's being retold. Okay. Now I get to, and, and this, this will become clear in the next ayah too, but now I want to get to the, the probably the most important part of this particular ayah. Al-Kitab and its quality, the description of the book, meaning the description of the surah, and also the description of the Qur'an as a whole, Al-Mubin. Al-Mubin, I translated it as clear and clarifying. So I use two words to translate Al-Mubin. The, these are divine signs, or those are divine signs of the clear and clarifying book. 
So I want to take some time to explain to you the difference between the word clear and the word clarifying and why both of those are important. Okay? Clear means something clear in and of itself. By itself, it's clear. Now that poses the question, what do you mean by clear? Clear in what sense? Right? And clarifying is something, the, the next step after that. So let's first talk about clear. Clear means that the book makes itself clear that it's not the word of a human being. Like when you hear it, you can clearly tell a person didn't author this. If you contemplate it, that conclusion will become what? Clear. It, and the word clear in Arabic, you know, mubin, comes from the verb abana, which comes from the origin bana, which means to separate. Meaning, when you read it, it separates itself from the word of human beings. You can tell this is not the product of a human mind. Okay? That's also going to be very evident because some group of Jews came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Oh, you have scripture? Well, how did the Israelites come to Egypt then? Can you tell us? And he's an Arab prophet, living in Arabia, you know, Thawian. Yeah, he's actually been there for many, many, many generations. His, his ancestors have been there for many generations. They have no access to the Hebrew scriptures. And yet, Allah is going to give to him clearly details of what transpired with this Israelite prophet thousands of years ago and make it very clear that the Prophet ﷺ has accurate information that was not accessible in a human sense. Human beings did not have access to that information, and they know that. So when they hear him talk about it, it's going to be very clear to them that this book is the book of Allah. You get it? So it's the fact that he's going to be able to tell them these things that it's going to make it clear to them. How else is the book clear? So the first thing is it's clear that it's, that it's the word of Allah. It separates itself from the word of human beings. The second is it's clear in its message. It's not confusing. It's not ambiguous or abstract. You know, the, it's not using words that people can't understand or process or I don't know what's the point of this. I don't get it. What, is, what does it want from me? Its message is very clear and straightforward. It doesn't beat around the bush. It gets to the point. You know, it, it doesn't speak in abstract terms. It speaks, it speaks in very direct, clear, explicit, depicted terms. In, 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 Sometimes Allah will talk about something briefly and then He'll explain it Himself. So he, it's a very self explanatory. That's the actually by the, the word self explanatory or self evident, even, is the word bayin from the same origin. Ayatin bayinat. Right? That clear in and of themselves. So that's it's clear in its message. And then, thirdly, I would add that the Book of Allah is clear in what it wants from me and you. Like it's clear in its message, it's clear in the way it tells a story, it cle it's clear in the way it describes God, it's, it's clear in its way it describes the afterlife, it's clear in the way it talks about history, it's clear about all those things, its message, but it's also very clear that it doesn't just come to entertain you with a story. It's also very clear that it's not just there to give you interesting philosophical or theological information. It has demands. It is, it's pulling on its reader and its listener and it's demanding some, them, from them a change in, the, in themselves. A change in the way they think, a change in the way they feel, a change in the way they control themselves, a change in the way that they commit themselves to certain things and commit themselves away from other things. It demands a change. And it's very clear about that. So in every sense of the word, the book is what? Clear. Now I'm going to give you an example. Imagine that you have a light bulb, a lamp of some kind, right? But the, you know how lamps have or a torch, a flashlight. A flashlight has a glass in front, right, that helps the light spread. Now imagine that that glass is not clear. So it's, got, it's covered in dirt, or it's got mud on it, or something on it. When you turn the light on, is it able to clarify the path? No. Until the glass is clear, it is unable to what? Clarify. Unless it's clear, it cannot clarify. I said the book has two qualities. It is clear, and it also what? Clarify. The, so what is it going to clarify? The book is meant to clarify the way we should live. The book is meant to clarify the difference between right and wrong. The book is meant to clarify what really happened in history, separating it from the lies. Because a lot of prophets, lies are told about them, and the Qur'an came to set the record straight and make it clear, no, that's not what they were like. That's not what they ever did. This is what they were like. This is what the real account is. So it sets the record straight and it clarifies. So... 
and it, it clarifies the original purpose. It doesn't just clarify the events of history, it clarifies the purpose of history. Everything is heading towards a purpose. There's a reason why these events occurred. There's a reason they're being talked about. And so not just the facts. So in, in clarifying, this is the second piece, it can only happen if it's what first? Clear first. Now the thing, this is where the, the, the scary part happens for a Muslim. The Quran in and of itself is what? Clear. But Allah made it the responsibility of the Ummah to go out there and clarify. Take what Allah has given you that is absolutely what? Clear. And go out there and clarify reality for people. Those who repented, corrected themselves, and then went out and clarified. The book is not going to go on clarifying itself. You know, it could be that some people stumble upon the Quran and find the truth. That happens, right? But actually, the purpose of the Quran and our purpose as an Ummah, the Prophet ﷺ left us with this responsibility. Go communicate on my behalf even if it's a single ayah, right? Why did he do that? Because our job was to take this crystal clear message and take this light and then share it with people. And when people are living in darkness and all of a sudden they see a little bit of light, they can see things for what they really are. Because light helps you see reality for what it is. If the lights were turned off in this room, I would run into furniture and equipment. But once the lights turn on, I know what to avoid. So when believers carry the light of revelation, they're able to, and share it, they're able to help other people see what they didn't see before. And when they see that, they're like, I want to, I want, can I hold on to that light too? You have a torch, can I have it? And they'll, they'll come to it because they see how much it clarifies, how much it opens up. And so that's the role of the Quran, both clear and clarifying. And inshallah ta'ala, my, my motivation, my personal motivation for these lecture series, for the work that I do in Bayina, is people that I was inspired by that dedicated their lives to one thing. They felt that the Quran has not been clarified, not even to the Muslims, forget non-Muslims, right? That we haven't done our job clarifying the word of Allah. The book of Allah is clear, but it hasn't been what? Clarified. And that's where we fell short. And when I first started learning the Quran when I was maybe 18, 19 years old, I felt like I was robbed for 18 and 19 years. I lived in the Muslim world. I've been praying since I can remember, but I didn't know this book and what it was talking about, not the way that I, when I first actually went through the book, cognitively with my mind actually open, not falling asleep, I realized, whoa, I, I had no idea what's in this book. And this is, this is our book? And we don't know it? Like, it, it was a shocker for me, right? And so it, I, I felt the need for it to become clear to me. And once it started to become clear to me, I felt the urge inside me to want to clarify it for others. Because what I found so illuminating for myself what I found so priceless, it would be a tragedy of, of mine, such a, I, I can't even keep it in myself. Like I just wanna share, hey, you know what I found? You know what people do nowadays? They like a video and they share it, right? And they, they, they share ridiculous things. They share like Baby Yoda memes or whatever. Or they share cat, cats playing pianos or I don't know. They share stuff like that. But if something really moved you, like something changed your life, Something transformed you from inside. Wouldn't you want to just tell someone, hey, you know what I just found? You know what this just, just did for me? You know? And so we become, in a sense, every believer that comes to the Quran becomes a living testimonial of what the word of Allah did for them. And then they share that, how it clarified things in their life. And then they want to go out and share it with others and clarify it in their lives. So that's a little bit about Tilka Ayatul Kitab al Mubin. Now let's go to the second ayah. No doubt about it, it is we in fact, we sent it down as an Arabic recital, as an Arabic recital, so that all of you can understand. Also means hopefully all of you can understand. And it could also, it could also mean that so that you might understand. So all of you might understand. And actually, I, I'll even change the word understand. I'll say so you might think and understand. Ta'akilun means two things, thinking and understanding, which are separate. They're not two different, two, they're two different things, okay? So now let's dig into this ayah and first of all, appreciate its connection. Notice in the first ayah, Allah called it kitab. In this ayah, he's calling it Quran, yeah? So what's he doing? He's telling us that it's in a written form in the heavens, 
and it was turned into something to be recited in Arabic on the tongue of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We have sent it down, meaning by way of Jibreel, as as hal, an Arabic Quran, an Arabic Quran. So it's the it's the story of the Hebrews, the Israelites, the sons of Israel. That's the story of Yusuf. It's found originally in Hebrew, and yet now it's coming down as an Arabic recital. The Arabs have no business telling this story. It's not your story. Yeah, they have no business, but the master of the Arabs and the master of the Hebrews, it's all, it's all his business telling you what story he wants to tell you. So he now reclaims the Israelite story of Yusuf as an Arabic recital. As an Arabic recital. But then he didn't just stop there. That he's going to tell it as an Arabic recital. First, he, he could have just stopped there. Inna anzalahu Quran al He said, so that all of you understand. The first meaning of that can be that the Israelites that were listening, that were there in Medina, or that were secretly feeding questions to the Quraysh, they understand that when he is going to give this story in Arabic, clearly it's coming from Allah because he definitely did not get this from the Hebrew sources. So what's his source then? How did he get this? Nobody else has this. How did he get it? And why is it so much more clear than even what we have in our open form? Why is it like that? So he says Quran in Arabia, an Arabic recital. But the other, there, there are other implications of it too. The Quran was meant to be recited. Allah could have sent it down as like the Ten Commandments, right? Like in the form of tablets. It could have come down in the form of paper. It could have come down as a book, already printed, published. But Allah sent it down in the form of the spoken word. You know what that means? That the legacy of the Qur'an in this world is that it should not just be read, it should be spoken. Its original experience for humanity is that its carrier, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, spoke the Qur'an. We say we follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That means we have to speak the Qur'an to people. What we've done from that sunnah is we recite the Qur'an, especially in this month, we recite the Qur'an and we reduce the Qur'an to sounds, beautiful sounds that are being heard. Those beautiful sounds are critical because they are a part of the Qur'an. But the Qur'an didn't come for audible you know, enjoyment. The Qur'an came as a message that should be heard. right? So the Ummah should have become people that do the recital. Literally, it's called the recital, the, the thing that is pronounced out loud. But he put it in Arabic. Like he, and then the Mufassirun said, well, he put it in Arabic because the original audience was Arab. How could they not... Because it says, we gave it as an Arabic recital so y'all can understand. Meaning y'all are Arabs, all of you are Arabs. How could you understand it in any other language? So it's obvious that he said it in Arabic. But there's a larger question. Allah knew that when he says, all of you understand, in 2020, when I read this, I'm not thinking just, all of you in Mecca understand. Or all of you in Mecca and Medina understand. Or all of you in Hijaz understand. I would be reading this, all of you in Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia, America. All of you across the planet will understand. Isn't this a book for all of humanity? Which creates the question, well, if the Quran is for everybody, how come it's just in one language? It's not my fault that I'm you know, Asian, or somebody else's fault that they're Hispanic, or somebody else's fault that they're Chinese, or somebody else's fault that they're Vietnamese. It should have come in Vietnamese to the Vietnamese people. You know, it should have come in Punjabi to Lahori. It should have come in you know, different dialects to different people. How come it's in Arabic so you can understand? And this is a, a, a deep question. Why is it, why, Allah, Allah says, and the answer to that for, for me, what I understand of the answer is a few things. One, the Arabic language, Allah prepared it for the final revelation. Allah prepared the Arabic language for the final revelation. He, it's, it's, the story begins with Ismail alayhi salam and all of that, but Allah chose the Kaaba to be in the desert. And he chose it to be in an isolated place with no natural resources up until the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. No natural resources whatsoever. So the Arab people were just herding sheep and you know, taking their camels across the desert for trade, but they were isolated. And the great empires of the world, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, nobody was interested in the Arabs to, to extend their empire because even if they extend their empire and take over the desert, what are they going to do? What, what are they going to get from it? Rivers? What are they going to get? Trees? Agriculture? Are they going to get gold? I mean, oil hasn't been discovered yet, so we're in a new territory now, right? Now everybody's fighting over Arab land. 
because of its natural resources. But back then, what was there? What natural resource? It had no value to the great empires of the world, which is why you've got the Roman Empire on the one end, you've got the Persians on the other end, you've got the Abyssinians on the other end, and none of them are interested in invading Arabia. They're just, it's just left alone. They're just left to their own device. Like, what are we going to get from it? They're like lost in history, this group. And they're by themselves. And when they're by themselves, their language becomes isolated for the most part. They do pick up some words from Persian and Greek, and when they do trade here and there, they pick up words and they incorporate them into their language. But not like what happens to, you know, international languages. Not, not, not like to what happens to cultures that have trade. Right? And this is, again, an important language concept. When you are a society that does a lot of international trade, then your own language deteriorates because it keeps getting contaminated by outside influences. Right? So uh, an easy example of that for you guys nowadays, ironically, is Mecca. Mecca was the most isolated place back then, just for the Arabs. But nowadays, when you go to Mecca, you go to Umrah or something, and may Allah open up, you know, end this, end this disaster of, of uh, Corona and allow us to visit Allah's house again. When you go there and you go in the marketplace, you've got some Senegalese guy selling the, you know, the, the prayer rugs, and he's selling it to some Indonesian woman, and he's telling her, Panch Rial, Panch Rial in Urdu. <laughs> and they understand, and she's responding in Bahasa, Indonesia, and he's speaking back in some mixture of English and Urdu. And I went to an Arab guy and I said, you know, in al matam in Pakistani. I asked him, what is Pakistani restaurant? He goes, in Talik Sida. <laughs> Sida is an Urdu word, Italic is an Arabic word. And this guy is like a born and raised Meccan and Urdu words came in to Arabic and just make this nasty cocktail of what was, that's not Arabic. But that's what happens when other cultures come in and cultures mix, language deteriorates. You don't have that phenomenon in Arabia. They are isolated for the most part. And because they're isolated, they're lame, and, and they don't have much to look at, man. When they go out at night, they just look at the stars because they got nothing on earth to look at. When they're out in the desert in the day, they're hoping they find a tree somewhere. You know? That's why their poetry is about horses, or about that one tree that they found, or the moon, or the stars. Because I mean, y'all got nothing else. So, and that, what, what it did is it made them very imaginative people. Their language became full of imagery and richness, right? And very expressive. In fact, the word Arabi, I was looking into the etymology of the word Arabic today. It would take me half an hour just to explain what the word Arabic means. Or Arabi means, well, I'll tell you a few things. One of its meanings is actually to express yourself and express all of your feelings in the most elaborate way. That's actually Araba. Araba amma fi dhamirihi. He opened up what, what, what was going on inside him. He elaborated it with great detail. Arabic is a very expressive, rich language, loaded language. Arab actually, Irba, also meant a river that's overflowing. This is why they also used it for a guy who's got too much in his stomach about to throw up. They use it for that too. Why? When something is so rich, it's going to what? Overflow. When you become a student of Arabic, one word in Arabic has so much meaning, it's like a river gushing and overflowing. That's what it feels like. Allah made this language that way. But a, a society where you're doing trade, you don't have time for that kind of poetic, picturesque, imagery language. You just gotta make the deal, panjriyal, panjriyal. You just gotta get the deal going and move on. That's why, you know, as I travel different parts of the world, um, I, I, I traveled across the United States, some of the worst English ever spoken that I've ever heard is in New York City. Like it's some of the worst English you'll ever, you'll go to like, you go to neighborhoods, like you go to Jackson Heights, or you go to like, you know, Junction Boulevard, I don't know if things have changed. I mean, I was there in the 1800s, so I don't know, but like, when you go to some of these neighborhoods, and English is like a foreign language, and it's so beat up and busted, and when you come out of New York, and you're actually in some university setting or some other kind of setting, and you're speaking actual, the actual language, you know, the, the English language, you're like, oh yeah, you're not supposed to say that. Oh yeah, that's not how that, oh yeah. <laughs> Because when because that's a it's a, an economic capital. The world traveled to New York, doesn't it? Not anymore right now. Allah, Allah help those people. But like the, the, there's international trade all the time. The point I'm getting at is Allah chose a language that had been isolated, and its words became extremely rich. That's just from a linguistics perspective. 
Not to mention the entire legacy of Ismail alayhi salam and the promise that Allah made to Ibrahim alayhi salam and all of that. That's part of the story too. But Allah is building this, this scene for what Arabic is going to do. The other remarkable thing about Arabic is, is I, I started thinking about this because it's something Umar radiallahu anhu said. He said, He said, learn Arabic because it enhances your ability to think. That's what he said. Now it's interesting. Umar is an Arab and he's talking to who? Arab. And he's like, learn Arabic. Wait, uh, sir, we already know it. I don't think anybody would dare say that to Umar radiallahu anhu. But the point is, when he, was in, when he was in a position of rule, Islam was becoming internationalized. And Arabic was deteriorating already. And our ability to think and contemplate the richness of the words of Allah is deteriorating because we're not learning Arabic more seriously. Right? So, for the first time, arguably for the first time, not because of colonization, but because of our commitment to faith, all over the world, Arabic became the language of the believer. We didn't abandon the other languages. The Persians kept Farsi and mastered Arabic. You know, the, the Indians mastered, you know, kept their Hindi, kept Urdu, kept Farsi, kept their local languages, Saraiki and Punjabi and all of it in Pashto, but they mastered Arabic. Wherever Islam went, Arabic went with it. So Arabic was no longer a language of the Arabs. Like the Arabs don't own it. Like you can say the Span Spanish language is for the Spanish. You know, Urdu, Urdu language for Desis or something. Right? German, the German language is for the Germans. But the Arabic language is for the people of the Quran. It just, it no longer belongs to an ethnicity. In fact, some of the most remarkable works on the grammar of the Arabic language and the rhetoric of the Arabic language were all written by non-Arabs. All of them. Sibawe is a non-Arab. The linguistic tafsir of the Quran al Kashaf is non Arab. Fakhruddin al Razi in his grammatical commentary, non Arab. The pivotal works in tafsir studies that we lean on to understand the grammatical nuances of the Quran, non Arabs. One after the other. One after the other. SubhanAllah. Why? Because, and it's not to say that non Arabs did a better job. Non Arabs came to the Arabs and learned it and said, This ain't yours anymore, this is everybody's. There are others than them that haven't yet joined them. So I know I'm taking a little long, but I gotta finish this point because this is so important, folks. This is so if you if you've been sleeping through everything else, just wake up for this like 10 minutes. And then you're good. Then you can go back to you know sleep. Uh, here's, here's the thing. In the history of religions, in the history of religions, you've got religions where the people that represent religious leadership, whether it's the, it's the saint, or it's the preacher, or it's the rabbi, or it's the minister, or it's the pope, or it's the, the, the swami, or the pundit, whoever, it's the religious figure, the spiritual figure, the scholarly figure, who knows their, the, the, the sacred word, and takes care of the sacred monastery, whoever, they are the custodians of the religion, and the public doesn't actually know the religion. In order for the public to know anything about the religion, where do they go? They go to the gatekeeper, they go to that religious leader, and he or she will tell them what the religion means. Right? So they can't have direct access to it. Even if they try to have direct access to it, they're going to have very limited access, historically speaking. And the actual access will belong to them. And when that happens, that's, when that extreme happens, then I'll give you an analogy. Imagine that you don't know a lot about cars. You know basically nothing about cars and you go to the mechanic shop and you're trying to get your car fixed and the mechanic tells you you need a new engine and you need new tires and you need a new steering wheel and you need a new set of seats and you need a new you need basically new everything and you're looking at him like because you don't know any better you have to go by his word is it possible that because he knows and you don't know he can take you for a ride he can take advantage of your lack of knowledge your lack of understanding he can if you're an informed consumer, however, if you know a little something about cars, or when he says you, you need a new engine, and you, you record him and say, why do I need a new engine? And he explains it to you. He says, actually, I got a second and third opinion, and I did some research. I don't need a new engine at all. I'm reporting you to the Better Business Bureau, or whatever. Right? Because you're an informed consumer, you can't be taken advantage of. What is the history of many religious traditions? Not entirely, but in, in and by the way, this happens within Islam too. There's one person or two people who know everything, and if you question them, it's like you're questioning God himself. How dare you question me? I'm the authority here. I'm the authority. So 
the religion started belonging to the clergy and the population is just at, basically held hostage by the clergy. And they trust them and they adore them and they love them, but they better not cross the line because they're going to they're get put in place. As a matter of fact, the clergy can decide that you're a kafir. If you mess with them too much, they can decide that you're no longer a believer or you're a heretic, or you need to be cleansed, or you need to be punished, or you're deviated, or you're, you're no longer pure, etc., etc. So they can condemn you as if God himself condemning you. That's one extreme. The Protestant extreme was, forget it, the Catholic Church is trying to control our reading of the Bible. We can read it ourselves. It's the Word of God. We should have access to it for who? For ourselves. And so, on the other extreme, you got people, a million people reading the Bible, and a million people coming up with different conclusions about what the Bible means. And so you've got more denominations coming out for my personal reading. I think the book is saying this, and I think it's saying that, and I think it's saying that. And something as fundamental as who Jesus is has a different answer depending on which denomination of the church you go to. You, you go to a, a, you know, cities across America where you have different denominations of churches, and you have a conversation about the, tr the reality of Jesus. Just Jesus. Jesus should be a common point, right? The Christian, common point. But because of the open reading of the Bible, and the open, like, any, I, I interpret it how I feel. My feelings are actually the mufassir, right? Everybody got their own version. Everybody got their own church started. Everybody got their own congregation. Everybody got their own, sometimes they're only even prophets. They declare themselves prophets according to their own reading of the Bible. They became prophets. All kinds of craziness. Why? Because it's a free-for-all. What does the Quran do? Because the Quran is also get, delivering religion. And if previous religions ended up either in chaos anarchy, or in dictatorship, right? Those are the two, right? Then how is, the, how is Islam going to be protected? Allah says, we sent it down as an Arabic Quran. So first of all, there won't be confusions about translation, or what a word might mean, or what a ayah might mean, because all of you, whether you are on one corner of planet Earth, or the other corner, corner of planet Earth, you're discussing the same exact word. You're discussing al mubin the Arabic word, and you're looking at its meaning in the same exact places. You're, there's no confusion about what a word means. You're all in the same place. Then, because of that, he, he didn't say, so that your religious leadership understands, and then they can explain it to you. What did he say? So that who understands? Who thinks and understands? So that all of you think and understand, and there are going to be degrees. Some people can think a little bit and understand a little bit. So they'll go to those who have spent a lot more time thinking and understanding, scholars. They'll go to them and ask them questions. But now because they are informed consumers, because they also for themselves think and understand. They don't think and understand as much as someone who studied 20 years, but they're still, they still have a brain that functions. They still think. So when they ask the clergy, a scholar, an imam, a shaykh, whoever, when they ask him a question, or her a question, and they get an answer to that question, and that question is not making sense in light of this ayah, or is not making sense in light of what I previously learned, they can say, hey, that doesn't make sense, I don't understand, explain it. I'm not convinced, because I can't stop thinking. I have to be a person of thought. So it, I hate the word democratize, but it did open source religion. It created transparency in the learning of Islam. All of that starts going away when we say, no, Allah should have sent me you know, the Qur'an in Pashto, I don't want to learn Arabic. Allah should have sent the Qur'an to me in Parsi, I don't want to learn Arabic. Allah should have sent the Qur'an to me in Punjabi, I like Punjabi. Or how about Bangla? How about Bahasa Malayu? I, I want to learn it in my own language, I don't want to learn it in Arabic. I don't, I don't want to follow the Arabs. Oh, the whole, this is an Arab thing, died a long time ago, folks. This is, this, the Qur'an is not an Arab thing. First of all, it's not a thing, it's the word of Allah. And second of all, he owns all languages. People don't own a language. People don't own a language. Just like people don't own the Qur'an. The same one who said he taught the Qur'an, he said he's, he taught speech. He taught, so all speech belongs to Allah. So, if I speak Urdu, doesn't mean I own Urdu. It's actually Allah who owns it. All languages are children of the language taught to Adam a.s. So he gave us the Arabic Quran so that we as an ummah have a minimal level of understanding, thinking and understanding, and then on top of that, our knowledge and our wisdom can be built. You know, it's a remarkable thing that Allah did. But imagine what happens to an ummah 
when we abandon our direct connection with the Quran, therefore, as a result of that, we abandon the study of the Arabic language. We just say, Let, let's just recite some surahs, let's have my kid have some Qadi Saab come home, and he'll recite the whole Quran to my kid, and they're gonna finish you know, making the sounds, and then we'll give them a cake in an in a Islamic party, Islamic uh, finish the Quran party. Right, which looks like a birthday party, but it's basically I finished reading the Quran party. Like my Quran khatam kar diya. Achha, ni aap khatam hoge, Quran khatam nahi hua. Like yeah, I, I finished the Quran. They say you finished the Quran. Anybody ever finished the Quran? <laughs> You're gonna get finished. Quran don't get finished. <laughs> you know. So we we develop this mentality that the Arabic sounds are the Quran. No, the Arabic language is the Quran, not the Arabic sounds. Sounds are only a part of the language. But that message was supposed to be there. And imagine, imagine just for a moment, just use your imagination for a second. We have, you know, schools around the world, masjids around the world, where kids are memorizing the Quran. Yes? By the thousands, hundreds of thousands, not millions, millions, memorizing the entire Quran. Can you imagine every man, woman, every, every man, woman, child, every young boy, every young girl that's a teenager or preteen, and they're memorizing the Quran, and they understand every word that they recite every single day? Can you imagine the effect on their hearts the effect on their character. As they're just reviewing the Quran, as they're you know, driving to school, you know, because they're, you know, it's not, they're not just reviewing it because they have to leave Taraweeh. So they better get the sounds right. They're reviewing it, and as they're reviewing it, it's Allah actually talking to them. Allah actually, what kind of overall effect would it have on the Ummah? You know, these were not, these would not be memorizers of the Quran then, these would be carriers of the Quran. There's a difference between memorizing it and carrying it. And he says, we gave this as an Arabic Qur'an so that all of you can understand. So, you know, I hope you appreciate the value and the, the kind of renaissance, the kind of restoration that can come to the Ummah when we re-emphasize the learning of the language of the Qur'an so we as a people have direct access to our scripture. So that we have direct access. Like, my, my, my wish for the Ummah, my own children, and the, the, the kids I see around me, people around the world, my wish for them is people like me should become irrelevant because they have access. They have direct access. They don't have to wonder what this word means. It's not, I wonder what, they can do that research themselves. They can ask each other. They can, they can have halaqat among themselves and contemplate the word of Allah among themselves. What an amazing thing that would be. So he says, we sent it down as an Arabic Quran so all of you can, can think and understand. Last comment, think and understand, I promise. Three minutes, I'm done. Three minutes, I'm gonna time myself. I got another timer. It's turning off. It won't turn off. Well, I'll time, I'll time it, okay. Document, I said think and understand. Number one, everybody thinks. And you can have all kinds of thoughts. Your thoughts can go in any direction. But the right kind of thoughts lead towards understanding, yes? Because the wrong kind of thoughts lead towards misunderstanding. The word ta'qilun actually combines thought and understanding. The word ta'qilun actually also means control over one's emotions. We gave you an Arabic Quran because the Arabic of this Quran is going to empower you. It's going to be so moving that it will direct your thoughts in the right direction so you come to the proper understanding and it will give you the ability to stand against your own urges, your own anger, your own fear, your own anxiety, your own lust, your own whatever your own selfishness, any, any emotion that we have inside, it can put brakes on it. لَعَلَّكُمْ <laughs> تَعْقِلُونَ So we give you an Arabic Quran that is for the, the, the mind and the heart. And that's inside the word تَعْقِلُونَ You know? And the place in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, you know, their hearts became hard, your hearts became hard. And then He says, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ ثُمَّ بَسَلْ قُلُوبُكُمْ don't you use your aqal, your hearts became hard. Because aqal directly affects the heart too. Because it is the opposite of jahl. Jahl means in, inability to control one's emotions. We have to become thinkers. The Quran is not emphasizing knowledge. This is within my three minutes now. The Quran is not emphasizing knowledge. The Quran is emphasizing thinking and understanding. Someone can have this little knowledge, but they think properly and they understand properly. And somebody can have this much knowledge and they never use it to think properly. Yusuf salam had very little knowledge because he only was a student of Yaqub salam learning from him at a very young age. So as a kid, he got an Islamic education. And then he got kidnapped, and then he's in jail, and he doesn't know much. He doesn't know much. All, what he knows, salam is what his father taught him as a child. That's it. And even in his adult years in jail, 
He, his thinking is clear. His understanding is clear. His control over emotions is mighty because he understands revelation in that way. And that's what Allah has given us in the Arabic Quran. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qidun. Inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we'll deal with the third ayah of the surah and then the day after we can begin the story itself. Barakallahu wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.